Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be able to gather here today in your presence, Father. And as I listened during worship, I heard the sound of many people singing in one voice to a loving Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray that your message convicts us, Father, to live our lives in a way pleasing to you. Lord, may there be nothing within me that hinders your message today. And I pray that it goes out with power and achieves its purpose. These things we pray in your name. Amen. Good morning. As you may have noticed, I'm not Dale McCamish. My name is Tony Naylor. Dale and I do look somewhat alike, as you can see by the picture there. But one of us is clearly more handsome than the other. But I don't think it's a contest. Dale and I are brothers. I love him. And I'm actually up here today because he challenged me to step outside my comfort zone. To come and preach the word. And with his help, he's helped me guide me through this process. I am confident that under his tutelage, this is going to be the best sermon that you're going to hear this morning. (laughs) A little bit more about myself. I'm currently serving in my third year as an elder of this congregation. And it's such a blessing because this is my church home. I was born and raised here. And so many of you have made a humongous impact on my life and helped me to grow and mature in my faith. And it's because of God's grace and the love of this family that I stand here before you today. My life is a beautiful example of the giftedness this congregation that you all have to raise your youth to become disciples. You should be commended. I've been married to my beautiful wife now, Jill, for 12 years, and we have two wonderful children, Ava, who is soon to be nine, and Jet, who is four. And it doesn't take long to figure out as a parent that it's a tough journey. We are not only called to be Christians and disciples ourselves, but to raise our children to become disciples. And it doesn't take long to figure out that children are like sponges. They soak up every word, action, and behavior they see. You think kids, or excuse me, you think bounty is the quicker picker-upper. Try saying a bad word on accident in front of your four-year-old and see how quickly they pick that up. We're laughing because we've all been there. We know what we're talking about. Well, I think the issue at hand is selfishness. We tend to be selfish by nature. God puts it best in Jeremiah 17, 9. He tells us that the, our hearts are deceitful above all things. They're beyond cure. Who can possibly understand this? To think that we are just born selfish to the core. The world must cater to our every want and desire. Otherwise, we will be fit to be tied. I think on a basic level, what this means is we're born with a mean case of the gimmies. And if I were to explain this better, I can do it through a story. So my son and I, we had a honeydew list. We were going to paint the front door for my wife. And so we went to Lowe's. Jet loves to go to Lowe's. He likes to check out all the power tools and look at all the lawn tractors. And we were, you know, manly time. We were having a really good time. We put everything in the cart. and Things were going so well. Had a great time. Until... We headed to the checkout counter. That's when Jet did a quick survey of the cart and the warning face came. That right there is the look of sheer terror. I know I have about 10 seconds to try to resolve this situation or we're having a meltdown. Well, as you can imagine, I failed to resolve this situation. There are no toys in Lowe's. Not one to be found anywhere. Anyway, The situation escalated. The reason it escalated is because he wanted a toy. He wanted something for himself. What's in it for me? There's nothing in this cart for me, Dad. And over and over he would shout and he got got more animated. He cried and I know I cried. And it seemed like it went on for a really long time. But in reality it was just a couple minutes. But I couldn't help thinking to myself, son, how can you be so selfish? He's selfish because he's watched me. He's picked up my behavior. That's why he's exhibiting that behavior. If I'm honest, 
This is how my relationship with God was at the beginning. And when I say the beginning, I mean for 20 years or more. It's all about what's in it for me. I want what I want. I wanted salvation. Who doesn't want to be forgiven of their sins? Who doesn't want the eternal reward of heaven? Well, when I thought that I had secured that, I tucked it away. And I was free to live my life as I saw fit. And I could attend church and be a good Christian. But as I attended church, over and over, I would hear that true followers of Jesus would be known by their fruit. So I examined my life. I was found to be very lacking in this department. In fact, I was a barren tree. No one would plant an apple tree and expect it to never produce apples. At that point, it's not an apple tree. At best, it's firewood. How could I call myself a follower of Jesus Christ if I was a barren tree? And so I had a realization. Jesus didn't die. He didn't give his life for me to go to church. He gave his life for you and for me so that we could become his church. Take a moment and think about this. What would happen if you were to examine your life? Are you bearing fruit in your life? What reward are you storing up in heaven? Where in your life might you be a little selfish? So how can we move past this this selfish tendency we have from being converts to disciples? Well, I think there's two steps that any Christian can take to train their hearts to become disciples. And that is, read the word and trust the Lord. That's pretty simple. But these are action steps. They require intentionality, discipline, and effort. And I can admit that I didn't have this early on. I didn't read my Bible on a daily basis. In fact, I only read it when I would bring it to church with me, maybe once a month or once every two months. I suppose my plan for God's Word transforming my life was going to be through the power of osmosis as it sat across the room on the shelf. It didn't work for me. I know it won't work for you either. It wasn't until I became intentional about reading God's Word that things began to change. You know what the first thing to change was? God increased my desire to spend time in his word. I couldn't get enough of the greatest love story ever told. I was so drawn to scripture, especially to the book of Psalms. I wanted the relationship that David had with his heavenly father. This deep, intimate relationship. David would pour out his heart on a daily basis, no matter the circumstances. He would seek his will in every situation. Man, how how did he get such a relationship? Part of it, I believe, is that David held God's word so close to his heart. He revered it. I'd like to take a look at Psalms 19. If you would all open your Bibles with me to Psalms chapter 19, we'll be reading verse 7 through 14. Psalms 19 is such a beautiful description of the power, joy, and truth that God's word brings into our lives. Now read along. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are radiant, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and innocent 
of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's beautiful, right? Let's take a closer look at the beginning of this passage, specifically verses 7 and 8. What can God's word do to transform our lives? Let's take a look at the power of God's word. The beginning of verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. I think it's fair to say that this world has kind of gone a little bit fitness crazy and health nut. All the health nuts these days are all about eating kale and berries and seeds and all kinds of superfoods, and you can ju juice a turnip. Why you would do that, I don't know, but evidently it's really good for you. It revitalizes your body. Well, our spiritual superfood is Scripture. It's fully sufficient. All that we need to grow and mature in knowledge, wisdom, and love has been perfectly provided by our Heavenly Father. His Word can transform our lives. It can mold us into what He wants us to be, disciples. But the key is we have to develop a habit of spending time in His Word. We don't have to remind ourselves on a regular basis that we need to eat. We're pretty good at remembering that. But we do have to make a concerted effort to feed ourselves healthy food. We are constantly filling our hearts with something, whether it be Netflix, Facebook, conversations, books, whatever it may be, whatever the source is, I want you to ask yourself, is it spiritually healthy? If you want to refresh your soul daily, read God's word. Moving to the second half of verse 7, we read, The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making wise the simple. The Bible is absolutely reliable. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Since all scripture is given to us by God himself, we can find the wisdom, that pure, that life-changing wisdom that we so desperately need. James 1.5 says, if any of us lacks wisdom, which we probably all do, we can ask God because he gives generously without finding fault. It will be given to us. If you seek wisdom, heavenly wisdom, read the word. Verse 8, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. In an ever-changing world, it is good to have a solid foundation that we can stand. We can build our lives upon scripture. Only God's word alone is the perfect truth. That truth gives us peace. That peace surpasses all understanding. And because of that peace, we can overflow with joy. And it is the joy of salvation. The thoughts and the opinions of mankind have been tainted by sin and negativity. We don't have to look too far, whether it be in the news or social media, to see that this world is growing increasingly wicked and hostile towards God. Let's not rob ourselves of the peace that God's word can bring into our lives. Read the word and bring joy to your heart. And the last part of verse 8, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. God's word is radiant and it is holy. Everyone do me a favor and put your hand up just like this. This is one of the first things I learned in Sunday school. This little light of mine. Those who are in Jesus Christ have the power of the Holy Spirit within them. The light of Christ. We carry that wherever we go. Are we shining our light for others to see? Do we see others as God sees them? We don't see people as skin color. We don't see people as from a different country. We are one. We are mankind. We are God's creation. And we either lost or saved. Do we, do we seek 
the lost? Do we shine the light of God and show them God's love? Read the word and lighten your eyes. As we become intentional about reading God's word, that effort that we put in, it helps us into growing our trust in God. What does it mean to trust God? By definition, trust means to regard something as right or true. That's a belief. It also means to put in the put excuse me, to put into the possession or safe keeping of another. Let's read that again. It means to put into the possession or safe keeping of another. Are you trusting your life to God? Do you put your life into the safe into the Father's hands for safekeeping? Do you give him control? I found an acronym that can be a helpful reminder to teach us how to trust God. Starting with the letter T, turn every aspect of our lives over to God. The scriptural reference would be Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. That straight and narrow path is the path that leads to salvation through the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. He is our Lord and Savior. Make him the Lord of your life today by turning every aspect of your life over to him. Hold nothing back. As Christ gave all for you and for me at Calvary, take up your cross daily, deny yourselves, and follow him. Trust in him. Our Realize that God has a plan for our lives. Romans 8, 29 through 30. His plan for us is to conform to the image of his son. To do this, we have to believe the gospel story. We have to believe that we have sinned. And that that sin has caused the chasm between us and God. It separated us from a relationship with our heavenly father. But then we can trust that God made a redemption plan through his son, Jesus. That he lived among us. He taught us what the kingdom of heaven was like. He trained disciples while he was here on earth. And then the greatest act of love ever. He was crucified for our sins and God's wrath was exhausted at the cross. God then raised Jesus from the dead and Christ sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven until the day he returns and he is coming back. We can become his sons and daughters if we put our trust in the gospel, repent of our sins, confess Jesus is our Lord and Savior and be baptized in his name for the forgiveness of sin and, of re- and we receive the Holy Spirit. Trust the gospel. It is God's redemption plan. You is understand that we may not always understand. Jesus tells his disciples in John 16, 33, that man in this world, you're going to have some trouble. It's going to be rough sledding here when I'm gone. But you can take heart because I've overcome the world. I mentioned how I admired David's life and how he had such a deep relationship with God. But if anybody maybe had cause to question or have difficulty understanding God's plan, it would have been David. David was anointed as a young shepherd boy to be the future king of Israel, right in front of all his older brothers. I bet that was awesome. But it didn't change right away. The waiting game began. You see, it could have been... even a couple of decades of waiting in David's life before he became king, before God was ready to to put him as king of Israel. Those weren't easy years in David's life. In fact, David spent most of the time either in battle or on the run. He feared for his life most days. He had to run and live in foreign country, afraid for his life as the king Saul would try to hunt him down. And even though His life was difficult. He feared for it every night, even when he had opportunity to end it all, to end Saul's life. 
on two separate occasions, he chose to trust in God rather than take things into his own hands. Trust God's timing rather than his own. When we don't understand, do we allow God time to work in us? S is seek his will every step of the way. Matthew 6, 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you. We have a tendency to just call for divine intervention in the big times when, when we really want something. I, I really need this job. The job I'm in currently, it, it stinks. It's driving me crazy. This would be such a better opportunity for me, Father. Please. Or when we have sickness in our lives, we pray for healing. We can talk to our Father each and every moment of the day. You don't need an unlimited data plan for this. We have the Holy Spirit. We can talk to God each and every moment of every day. Let's seek his will in every situation. T is thank him even when things don't turn out the way we expect. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is one of the hardest parts of trust. Things don't always turn out the way we expect or the way we want them to. But our thankfulness should not be predicated on our happiness, our level of contentment, whether or not we get our way. What about, what if we thanked God for who he is, what he's done? He is a loving heavenly father. And we should praise him each and every moment of every day for what he is and what he's done for us. Another way that we can put trust in the Lord is in communion. As we gather together, we are reminded in scripture that as we gather, we do this in remembrance of what Jesus did at the cross for us. That sin that broke the relationship between us and God. Jesus rectified that. He redeemed us from our sins. And this meal is a reminder. It's a reminder of that sacrifice. The body and the blood. We take those. And as we take those, let us examine our lives. Where in your life do we need to put our trust in the Father more? Where in your life are we maybe being a little selfish? How do we bear more fruit? Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are just so thankful for your word, the power that it has. We are so thankful for the gospel that your son, one and only son, came to live among us gave his life for everyone, anyone who would call upon his name. Father, as we examine ourselves, our lives, I pray that you convict us through your word. Let it enlighten our eyes and see where in our lives we need to tear down the walls and just give you control over our lives. Lord, we are so thankful that we have the ability to gather as one. We were bought at the highest of price. Let us not forget this, Father. It is in your name we pray. Amen.